supply chain is not part of the economy. Supply chain is the economy. And I was, if you want to understand the economy, you're, you're really talking about the supply chain at every aspect. You know, something as simple as a, a loaf of bread, you know, you buy a loaf of bread at the grocery store, like, okay, well, I guess it came from a baker and I guess they took it from the bakery to the store by truck. So there's a supply chain. Well, that's about as simple a version of the supply chain as you can imagine. You have to just start going from there. I was like, well, did the bread come in a plastic wrapper or a paper wrapper? Well, that wrapper came from somebody. Where the truck come from? Well, obviously a truck manufacturer. Where the driver come from? Somebody had to make a career choice and and be trained. And what about the diesel fuel in the truck? You know, that, well, that came from refinery and that came from oil exploration. Uh, then you get back to the baker and it's like, oh, well, I guess he had an oven or she had an oven. You know, where did that come from? And then you find out that the ovens are you know, industrial ovens have parts from 25 different countries and, and so forth. Well, without belaboring that point, you get back to the farmer and the wheat and the fertilizer and, and everything else. And really what's called the extended supply chain. And you're like, wait a second, that's a huge number of countries, a huge number of imports and a big part of the economy, which it is. And then every link in that supply chain I described has its own supply chain behind it to get to source materials and intermediate manufacturing and so forth. And then that's for a loaf of bread. Well, what about your car, your furniture, your clothes, and, and, and on and on and on. Once you start thinking about what supply chains are, you realize it's just the cardiopulmonary system of the entire global economy. So, you know, the supply chain book shines a light on the entire global economic process. And I have whole chapters on that uh, talk about China, the war in Ukraine, and climate change. And you say, well, you know, the interesting topics, but what do China, Russia, and climate change have to do with the supply chain? Well, the answer is they are, you know, kind of global macro earthquakes. Uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine led to sanctions against Russia that affect everything, you know, imports, exports, strategic materials, semiconductors, uh, fertilizer, oil, natural gas, et cetera. Again, you're saying, well, okay, Boeing makes aircraft. They need titanium and aluminum. Where does that come from? Turns out about 30% of it comes from Russia. So how are you going to keep the Boeing assembly line going when you're shutting down strategic metals from Russia? It can go kind of on and on there. China, you know, everyone says, well, they slowed down because of the zero COVID policy. And that certainly has been detrimental to their economy. Shanghai, a city of 26 million people, Beijing, a city of 22 million people, they were both locked down entirely last spring. When I say entirely, you know, no transportation in or out, uh, nobody on the streets. You had some essential workers, people had to get to work. You had to have a COVID uh, test, a negative result uh, that was not more than two days old. Uh, so these were extreme lockdowns and obviously very, very detrimental to the economy. Um, now, those have died down a little bit, and China's saying, now we're going to relax our zero COVID policy a little bit. So what's new? What, why are supply chains breaking down? Kind of what's new about the supply chain that makes it different than any other period in the history of the world? And what's new were, were two things, and they arose around 1989. The first was you had a combination of increased computing power, algorithms, artificial intelligence, better data collections, a new model. So you suddenly had the, the computational telecommunications and data and mathematical tools to be a lot more sophisticated about how you handle the supply chain. But the second thing that happened at the same time was 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1991, the uh, collapse, the demise of the former Soviet Union, which gave rise to new trading partners and both in Eastern Europe, where they were no longer behind the the Iron Curtain, you know, Poland and Romania and uh, Hungary and, um, and many other countries. And at the same time, you had the rise of China. China did have a fairly high growth period in the 1980s, but um, nothing like we see today. And it all came crashing down in 1989 with the T Tiananmen Square massacre. And that really shut down US-China relations, not fully, but there was, you know, there was no, there was no Western investment coming into China. The two countries were distant. Well, that ended around 1992. Deng Xiaoping did what he called the Southern Tour, where he reaffirmed China's commitment to capitalist principles. They weren't overthrowing communism, but they were embracing capitalist market ideas. There was a thaw in U.S. relations. And then it was like, you know, no holds barred. Then, then that's when the U.S. investment really did pour in. So, so all in a, a short period, 
between uh, 1989 and 1992, um, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, new republics, China kind of re-enters the game, and all this, this was this was globalization. So now all of a sudden you had the science I described, you know, computing and artificial intelligence and applied math and a true global market. So now now the supply chains could go 9,000 miles from Chongqing to New York or from, uh, you know, Shanghai to Seattle or, you know, London to, uh, to, to Hong Kong, of course. So this was true globalization, much larger scale, much, much longer supply chains. And it worked. And so this was a period I call supply chain 1.0, 30-year period from 1989 to 2019. Now, why did it break down around 2019? Three things. A lot of people look at the pandemic and they go, oh yeah, COVID, that disrupted everything. That was the problem. And some people look at the war in Ukraine and the Russian sanctions and go, that was the problem. And they both made it worse. They both made it worse, no doubt about it, made the supply chain worse. But it really started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs on China. So he put uh, Trump put tariffs on appliances and solar panels. Well, China didn't stand still for that. So China said, well, what can we do? to strike back. Well, at the time, China was and is the world's largest importer of soybeans. They need the protein. They don't have enough. The US and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. Well, China was buying all their soybeans from the United States because they were trying to reduce the trade deficit. We were buying so much stuff from them. And China said, well, what can we buy from the US just to kind of balance the books a little bit? And the answer was soybeans. Well, when Trump put the tariffs on, China redirected all of their soybean orders to Brazil. They stopped buying U.S. soybeans and they bought them all from Brazil. Well, there's a lot more to that than a phone call. You got vessels and dry bulk carriers and uh, transportation lanes and port facilities. And, you know, if you're Brazil and you get all these orders, you know, you got to get trucks to get the soybeans to the ports. You got to open up port facilities, et cetera. The point is, this is a major, major shift in global logistics just to change the order book from the US to Brazil. Beyond that, people involved in this, they don't want six month contracts, they want five year contracts or at least three year contracts and they got them. And so now all of a sudden, China's buying all their soybeans from Brazil, but this scramble of global supply chains. Now, what are the US farmers doing? We're still growing the soybeans, we can't sell them to China. Well, it turns out the Netherlands needed them. So, okay, we'll sell them to the Netherlands and distribute them to Europe, which they did. And then this went on and on because Trump put more tariffs on to retaliate. China took more actions against the United States, canceled purchase. So, and it escalated from there. Now, again, COVID made it worse. The war in Ukraine made it worse. But it, it's very clear that that's where it started. So that's why I use 2019 as just, you know, kind of an arbitrary date with a 30-year period of supply chain 1.0. Now... We're getting to supply chain 2.0, but we're not there yet. We're in this like messy, in between, inefficient, muddling through period where things are broken, but they haven't, they'll never be put back together the way they were, but we haven't produced or created the new model supply chain. We're just muddling through and with a lot of disruption, a lot of empty shelves. You have to understand, it took us 30 years to build this. We blew it up in about three years. It's not going to come back overnight. It's going to take five or 10 years, or maybe longer to rebuild in, in some form. Countries like Switzerland, Germany, Austria, China, and various Asian nations have maintained a strong affinity for gold. In contrast to the United States, where gold investment is often overshadowed by more traditional financial instruments, these countries have a deep-rooted appreciation for the precious metal. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. They are accelerating their purchases and I do think it's a sign of things to come. Now, when, when you talk about retail, so you everyday investors, Americans, um, I love America, but have kind of given up on Americans and gold. They, they just, uh, there are, you know, there are people who have positions and, you know, your hedge funds will have paper gold, they'll do gold futures. But the everyday American has been, uh, oh, 40 years at this point of being miseducated on the topic of gold. So they, uh, they, they're not uh, very much into gold. You go around the world, you get very different results. You know, Switzerland, Germany, they, they, Austria, they love gold. Uh, of course, China, Asian countries, I think Australians have a much better sense than Americans do. So uh, there are the, the buyers of gold, but you say, well, okay. Who are the big buyers of gold? 
The answer is the central banks. Now, right there, that should tell you something. So these are the, the most powerful, most plugged in, most heavily monetary institutions in the world. And they're the ones buying gold. Now, they would have you believe that gold's not money, gold serves no purpose, you know, it's a... You know, they, the, the, the first ones to say John Maynard Keynes said it was a barbarous relic, which he never said, by the way. He said something. Uh, he said that he said he used the phrase barbarous relic in reference to the gold exchange standard of the 1920s, which was a hybrid gold foreign currency standard. But the foreign currency is not gold. So he said that's a barbarous relic. But he never said that about gold him, himself. And actually, at the end, toward the end of his life, he favored at Bret Woods, he favored a gold, uh, a global currency called the bank were backed by gold. And, you know, it's not guesswork. They're papers they published at the time. And that was rejected by the United States, which kind of ran the show, um, partly because our, uh, well, not to get too down on Louise, but our our, our, our undersecretary of the Treasury, who was our representative at Bretton Woods, was a Stalinist agent. He was a communist. This didn't come out until the 90s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, when a lot of classified information was release of KGB files, etc. But it was revealed and fully documented in a book by Ben Stile called uh, um, Donald Bretton Woods that he was a communist agent. So what was, he, what was he trying to do by insisting that, by running Keynes's idea off the road, insisting that the US dollar be the anchor, <clears throat> he was trying to destroy the British Empire, which he did because he knew that there were far more claims on the Bank of England when they had gold and that would be inherently unstable and that would derail Sterling as one of the global reserve currencies and undermine the British Empire, which it did. So um, that's a little uh, a little bit of a backstory, but it goes to the point that uh, Keynes was was an advocate for gold at different times in his career and at, and at the end of his career, and that when the central banks are buying, I should tell you something. Now I've said for years, um, you know, I've always pointed to Russia and China. Russia has uh, almost quadrupled their gold reserves in the last 12 years, starting in 2009 through 2020, uh, 2021. They've almost quadrupled, <coughs> pardon me, from about 600 tons to about 2,400 tons. China, the same, uh, not quite, uh, from about 600 tons to about just under 2,000 tons that they report but they're non-transparent. They have a lot more gold than that uh, stashed in uh, something called SAFE, the State Administration on Foreign Exchange, which is a secretive Chinese sovereign wealth fund run by an ex-PINCO guy, by the way, he knows what he's doing. Um, and they, they're they non-transparent. So the People's Bank of China is kind of transparent. SAFE is non-transparent. The crux of Jim Rickard's argument lies in the behavior of central banks, the most powerful and influential monetary institutions globally. Rickards highlights that central banks, including those in Russia and China, have been steadily increasing their gold reserves over the past decade. Russia, for instance, nearly quadrupled its gold holdings from 2009 to 2021, while China, although less transparent, has also significantly boosted its gold reserves. What is particularly telling about central banks' interest in gold is that they are the custodians of monetary policy and are deeply ingrained in the global financial system. Rickards argues that their preference for gold should not be dismissed as mere nostalgia for a bygone era when gold was the primary backing for currencies. Instead, it reflects a strategic decision to safeguard their wealth and financial stability in an ever-evolving economic landscape. Jim Rickards dispels the notion that gold is an outdated relic, as some critics argue. He points out that even renowned economist John Maynard Keynes, often cited as a critic of the gold standard, had different perspectives on gold throughout his career. Keynes indeed criticized the gold exchange standard of the 1920s, but he later advocated for a global currency backed by gold. So every uh, six, seven years, what you'll see is the People's Bank of China will announce, oh, we've increased our gold reserves by 400 tons or 500 tons or whatever as the case may be. And well, it sounded like they went out the night before and bought 600 tons. You know, good luck trying that, you can't do it. Well, what it means is that that SAFE took some of the, the hidden gold that they had been acquiring slowly and in an accounting entry moved it over to the People's Bank of China and boom, there's 500 tons overnight. But of course they had it all along and they still do. So they probably have more. So Russia and China are big acquirers, again, tripling and quadrupling their gold reserves. But now we're seeing it in a lot of other countries. Um, uh, in the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Mexico, 
uh, Iran is a major buyer, but non non transparent. Turkey has drastically increased its gold reserves. These are these are major countries, uh, and they're they're adding. So so I look at that, and there's there's very good data from the IMF and the World Gold Council, so you can find this information. But the one that was just like not doing anything was Japan. They had about 600 tons. But they had 600 tons for 30 years. <laughs> I went back to look at all the old days. It was like 30, never, that's boring. Who cares about Japan 600 times? And then just about, um, at this point, about six months ago, so late last summer, um, they bumped it by, uh, I believe it was, it was 50 tons, perhaps more. I look at the exact number, but it was over 50 tons overnight. It just went from, you know, 600 tons to 650 tons, just like that. Well, here's what you know. Same thing I said about Russia. You can't buy 50 tons overnight, or not, you couldn't even do it in a month. I mean, the the dealers would be working the order, it would be disruptive to the market. It would show, it would leave a lot of fingerprints, put it that way. But what it tells you is two things. Number one, Japan had the gold all along. They had it in some sidecar or side account or Ministry of Finance hidden account, what as the case may be, and they chose to move it over to their reserve position which they can do, that's an accounting entry, but they had to have, they had to have had the gold all along because you can't buy that much that fast. So then that begs the question, well, why all of a sudden? Why now after decades of holding your gold level constant, do you all of a sudden step up in a big way? Um, a lot of possible answers to that. One, you know, China's making noises about invading Taiwan. Well, if you're going to invade Taiwan, why not invade Japan while you're at it? It's just, it's just another chain of islands as far as the Chinese are concerned. Rickards emphasizes that the misinterpretation of Keynes' views on gold has perpetuated the misunderstanding of the precious metal's role in the modern financial system. In doing so, he underscores that gold has historically played a vital role in global monetary systems, and its significance should not be underestimated. As central banks continue to accumulate gold reserves, the question arises, why? Jim Rickards suggests several reasons. First, gold serves as a hedge against the U.S. dollar's potential devaluation due to inflation or loss of confidence in central bank currencies. Second, it can act as a buffer in times of economic crisis and geopolitical uncertainties. Rickards also speculates that the actions of central banks like Japan, which recently increased its gold reserves significantly, could be driven by concerns over the reliability of the United States as a geopolitical ally. The aftermath of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan has left many nations questioning their dependence on U.S. protection, leading some, like Japan, to fortify their financial and military positions. And after and this happened right around the time, maybe shortly after um, the U.S. debacle in Afghanistan, which was, you know, the worst foreign policy, uh, military disgrace, humiliation in U.S. history that I can remember. I don't know how far you'd have to go back to find a worse uh, turn, of, turn of events. Um, and, and that there it was. Well, all of a sudden, allies all over the world, you know, Israel, um, Japan, Taiwan, they're questioning the United States. Like, hey, we're, we, we thought you're un we're under your nuclear umbrella. You stand by us to thick or thin. Here you leave Americans behind enemy lines. So, um, so perhaps, now this is speculation, but perhaps Japan sees the threat to Taiwan, feels they may be in the, in the sights of the Chinese, feels the United States may not be as reliable as one had thought and says, well, we have to, we now have to step up a little bit financially, militarily, et cetera. And they're doing that. But it, but that aside, that's a little geopolitical speculation, but that aside, the gold is real. They put it on the books. So the biggest buyers of the gold in the world are the central banks. By the way, from 1970 to 2010, Central banks were net sellers. Now, some bought and some sold, but on, on net, they were net sellers. We had Brown's Bottom in 1999 when the UK sold half their gold at the lowest price in uh, about 60 years. <laughs> they, they, they literally hit the bottom at about $200 an ounce, give or take. Um, but, um, but since 2010, central banks in the aggregate have been net buyers, and that buying is accelerating. So, what does that tell you? It tells you that the most knowledgeable players in the world are adding gold to their reserves because they consider that a prudent hedge to the U.S. dollar, if you have U.S. dollar inflation, or to a collapse of confidence in uh, central bank currencies generally, um, or they're just saying, hey, we're, we're, we're part of the club. Uh, by the way, here's a good uh, trivia question for you. Uh, 
the Shay, if you're, you know, if you're in a, in a bar and with a lot of brainy economists around, uh, ask them, uh, bet, them, bet them a drink on this, ask them what percentage of U.S. reserves are in gold? The, the answer in China is about 2%. Uh, Russia is about 20%. Um, you know what the percentage is for the United States? It's got to be 0.5%. 70, 75%. 75%. 75%. 75. The U.S. does not rely on euros and Nazi dollars and Canadian dollars for its reserve position. A little bit, um, but um, 75% of U.S. reserves are in gold. So don't let don't let any central bank or don't let uh, Jay Powell or Johnny Allen or any of these others tell you that gold's not a monetary asset. We have the largest gold stash in the world and 75% of our reserves are in gold. So that's the U.S., uh, you know, as, as they say, uh, uh, watch what they do, not what they say. So tell me why it's a buy signal for stocks if the Fed is throwing the economy into such a bad recession that unemployment is going to go up significantly and growth is going to come down and inflation is going to come down. Why is that a, a, a buy signal for stocks? Maybe at the bottom, you know, and the bottom might not be till late 2023. Okay. Yeah, there's, there are opportunities to, to buy the bottom, but we'll be nowhere near the bottom. Bear market rallies are, are really interesting. Some of the biggest rallies in history have been in the middle of bear markets where you ended up losing everything. You know, you've got this pivot narrative. You can't quite get rid of the Some of the buy the dips people are still around. So count on them to, you know, buy into a, what could be a horrendous bear market. Uh, you got your buy and hold crowd. You know, remember in uh, 2000, 2001, the Nasdaq dropped 80 percent. And a lot of people got out, but a lot of, they said, well, just hold on to it. Well, it did come back, but it took until 2015. I mean, it took, that's a long time. A lot of people died in the meantime. You know, you're waiting 14 years to get back to where you were. So, uh, so those people are still around, but there is what I call the pivot crowd. So the Fed pivot is a narrative and it kind of goes like this. Yeah, the Fed's tightening. We see that. Inflation is going to come down really fast. The economy is going to slow down really fast. Both of those things are happening. Inflation, a little less so, but the, the economic slowdown is there. And the Fed's going to get the wake-up call and have to cut rates. And cutting rates, that's the pivot. They're going to pivot from rate hikes to rate cuts. And that's good for tech stocks, so buy stocks. Now, that's the narrative. There are two huge fallacies in that, uh, in that narrative. The first one is, uh, who says the Fed's going to get the message? And if you look at what Jay Powell said and what he repeated, we're going to raise rates. We're going to crush uh, inflation. Uh, you know, I've been following this for 50 years. I've, I've never seen a Fed chairman use the word pain three times in one paragraph, but he did. Uh, and he meant it. Um, he knows there's going to be a recession. They're causing it in, in part. Um, Unemployment is going to go up. He said that he tied unemployment to um, killing, you know, basically demand destruction and getting inflation under control. He said we're, that's how we're going to do it. Um, and uh, you're already starting to see some early signs of that. So with that as their focus, who says the Fed's going to you know, get a wake up call? Almost certainly not. I mean, they told us what they're going to do. They're going to raise rates. And then he said, if we see progress on inflation, we'll pause. But pause doesn't mean cut. It means just wait a long time because at that point, core PCE, that's personal consumption expenditure, core, which excludes oil and food, and that, that's just how they do it. That's their favorite metric. You can debate whether it's the best one, but it, the debate doesn't matter because that is the one they use. Um, that Let's say that comes down to around three and a half. Okay, it's still not two. Now, what Powell, which is their target, so what Powell said is, we don't have to keep raising rates to force it to two. We just have to raise them enough that it'll get to two on its own. That's what they call a restrictive, a restrictive policy. So, but that's not a rate cut. That's, that's, he said that might last for a year, all the way into 2024. That's when he was talking about rate cuts. Now, again, this, this can change, but, but they've told us what they're going to do. I always say, forecasting the Fed is the easiest thing I do because they actually tell you what you're going to do, what they're going to do. You just have to listen and believe them. Um, now, the hard part is understanding how badly they're going to destroy the economy and when they're going to get the wake up call. That's the hard part of the analysis. But telling what they're telling you what they're going to do is the easy part because they kind of tell you. 
So, so the stock market notion that somehow there will be cutting rates is just false. I, uh, yeah, I was around for the 2008 financial crisis. I was around for 1998 financial crisis. You know, I, I, I negotiated that uh, bailout for LTCM. Uh, 98 was interesting because it was a an acute financial crisis that came very close within hours actually and i was you know i was in the room with the treasury and the italian finance ministry and 19 banks and you know a thundering herd of lawyers trying to trying to save the world but uh, we we came within hours of shutting every market in the world there was a four billion dollar all cash you know you could you couldn't use the word due diligence because there wasn't time it was just hey the fed wants us to do this so let's just do it um so uh so that worked but um, it was it was you know it was a very close call. They would have shut down Tokyo and then around the world, London and finally New York. And yeah, they would have opened days later. But that's how, uh, with trillions of dollars of losses, it would have been worse than what actually happened in in 2008. It didn't happen. But there was no economic recession at the time. That was and that's that confuses a lot of people because and particularly if you're if you're using 2008 as a frame of reference. There are, there are financial panics and financial crises and liquidity crises, and there are recessions, some of which are severe. But they're two different things. Uh, 98 was a finan- an acute financial crisis with no recession. Um, 2000 was a mild recession, but there was no severe financial crisis. Now, NASDAQ collapsed, but there wasn't a lot of leverage in NASDAQ. There was, there was no contagion there, but it didn't spread because it didn't, no banks, no banks failed, no major brokerages failed, etc. cetera. Uh, so, so in 1990, a mild recession, but no financial panic. Uh, October 19, 1987, interesting, stock market fell 22% in one day not a week or a month, but one day down 22%. And that was a financial crisis, but there was no, there was no recession. Uh, so they're separate things. However, they can happen together. And 2008 was an example. There we had both, but I would encourage analysts to separate those two things. Again, they came together, it was, it was horrific, but, um, but they can happen separately. My, my point is, uh, what's coming is a very severe recession. The uh, uh, you know monetary tightening uh, on top of a world where growth is deaccelerating, inventories are sky high. You know the funny thing about the supply chain, we all remember headline: your know, supply chain is broken down. Uh, you know the, the shelves are bare. So all true that that was happening at the time, and that's when I uh, started working on the book. But what a lot of purchasing managers did um, and inventory managers, they they doubled their orders. They said, well, we're triple the orders. They said, well, if the supply chain's breaking down, and I want just a normal amount i better order three times as much or twice as much just to get what i want and they did well what happened was by the summer some of that pressure had been alleviated and here come the shipments into the warehouses that are twice as much or three times as much as what you needed at the exact same time that the fed was destroying demand and so demand drops off a cliff uh retail sales drop off a cliff the warehouses go from being empty to being full to the rafters and now all that merchandise is sitting there. So, uh, you know, Nike, I mean, just many examples. So what, are, what do you do when you're um, in charge of inventory? You cut prices. You, you don't want that inventory. It costs a lot of money to keep it in the warehouses, number one. Number two, a lot of it's seasonal. It's like, who wants to buy, you know, a summer dress in uh, December? And not too many people. Um, so they just slash prices. Uh, and that reduces margins and reduces profits. So we're just kind of flying into the face of all that uh, with the Fed tightening rates into weakness. The, the Fed will be the last to know because they're very model driven and the models are badly flawed, mostly with the Phillips curve and their focus on the unemployment rate, which uh, is is not a good measure of um, of what's going on in the labor force. So my expectation is the recession's coming. It's going to be really bad. Um, inflation is going to come down fast, but not quite fast enough for the Fed. Uh, they're going to keep raising rates, destroying demand, raising unemployment, and we're going to wake up with a, a severe recession, high unemployment, and a much lower stock market. You you brought up um, chapters one and two from from currency wars, where you you basically highlight. Uh, this scenario. Um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that Russia and China would accumulate large gold reserves, pool their gold, and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the U.S. dollar. Is that the form it would take for you, something backed by gold? Probably, and here's why. Um, and, and by the way, when I when I wrote that, and when we did the war game, and when I wrote that, 
Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in the State Administration of Foreign Exchange that we don't know about because that's the, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. Um, so, but uh, everyone's like, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency. No, and it's not going to be the group, but, but, but here's why. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons, but the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of $100 bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like the dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very liquid, no primary dealers, no win issue trading, no auctions, um, no repo, none of the sell no settlement clearance, none of the, uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of, uh, of a mature bond market such as the, uh, the United States. Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you, you know, someone reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and, and certainly the rupee will not replace the dollar as reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'll come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but, uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets and so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone, they estimate $200 million. You could have bought that for 50000 in the, in the 1970s. Uh, that's that's a little more specialized, but there are you know natural resources, uh, water, you know, et cetera, uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm just giving these as an example, but um, the, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself, but. Uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one. And, you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We, we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like what's what's truly going on there? Um, do we have a uh, is, is it just an aging population that truly can't work? Um, I know that disability has been a it's seen massive growth over the past like 15 years. Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having 62 percent of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, there are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. And you, know, you, you you listen to a number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the the, the uh, numerator, and how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now it's never a hundred percent, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles. 
enter the workforce, and then that number went up. So, it, like I said, it's never 100, but 70 was very strong. 62 is is down a lot. I mean, that's um, about a 14 percent decline. Um, look, you know, GDP. The standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus you know government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah, but there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working, how productive are they? Just who's working and how productive are they? That, that equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit. You know, it's put, a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home, um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robin Hood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But, um, but a lot of people saved the money, but, but there was a very, there were def- very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money. They'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit. A lot of people staying home watching, you know, maybe, uh, the world series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but, but some. And, um, the other problem is, uh, you know, because people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, they're help on the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, a entry level hamburger person. Um so there are la- the, the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins. You know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs and big, layoffs, big, yeah. big layoff announcements coming every day. So, um, not, none of which is good for, uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I always say, if you if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw Phillips curve was flat. Oh, where I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. You, you brought up um, chapters one and two from, from Currency Wars, where you, you basically highlight 
uh, this scenario. Um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that Russia and China would accumulate large gold reserves, pool their gold, and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the U.S. dollar. Is that the form it would take for you? Something backed by gold? Probably, and here's why.、Um, and, and by the way, when I when I wrote that, when we did the war game, and when I wrote that, Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less that we know of, and they may have several thousand tons off the books in the State Administration of Foreign Exchange that we don't know about because that's that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more.、Um, so, but、uh, everyone's like, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency. No, it's not going to be the group. But 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 here's why.、Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons. But the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of hundred dollar bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books.、Um, Not like dollars per se. So, if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist.、Uh, very small scale, very liquid. No primary dealers. No when issue trading. No auctions.、Um, no repo. None of sell. No settlement clearance. None of the、uh, the plumbing and the mechanics. Of、uh, of a mature bond market such as the、uh, the United States,、uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you you know somebody reneges on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for one of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and and certainly the ruble will not replace the dollar as a reserve currency. However. What I was hypothesizing then, and I would、I'd、come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank,、um, UK law,、uh, put the gold in a third-party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could deposit your own gold and get some of the currency, or trade with them, or run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you you would need the gold to to instill confidence.、Um, But、uh, they don't. They, again, they don't have bond markets, so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble, aren't going to replace anything. In the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim,、um, how, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well,、uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they?、Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver. You know, fine art.、Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone. They estimate two hundred million dollars. You could have bought that for fifty thousand in the in the nineteen seventies.、Uh, that's that's a little more specialized. But there, are, you know, natural resources,、uh, water, you know, etc.,、uh, energy, oil.、Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources,、um, you know, such as Exxon Mobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not.、Uh, I'm just giving these as an example. But、um, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself. But、uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio、um, is not a good one. And you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. We we seem to have a huge chunk of our working age population that is not working. And you probably study this more than most people. Like, what's what's truly going on there?、Um, do we have a Uh, is is it just an aging population that truly can't work?、Um, I know that disability has been a has seen massive growth over the past like fifteen years.、Um, you know, are there a bunch of people that are opting out or gaming the system or whatever? But what's responsible for us only having sixty two percent of our working age population actually engaged in working? Well, 
There are two answers to that, and but they're consistent. I'll give you both. The short answer is it doesn't matter. And no, you, you you listen to the number of factors. I'll go back over those factors, and you're, you're right. But it doesn't matter. It, it low is low. In other words, the the thing about labor force participation is a very simple calculation. You you say how many people are working. That's the the, the uh, numerator, and how big is the labor force? That's the denominator. That's all it is. Now it's never a hundred percent, right? Because there are students and homemakers and retirees and others. There are good reasons for some people not to be in the workforce at any given time. But as recently as 2000, that number was 70%. What drove it between 19, about approximately 1975 and 2000 was basically women entering the workforce, women who had been home, um, you know, as homemakers or, uh, you know, performing other roles enter the workforce. And then that number went up. So it, like I guess it's never a hundred, but 70 was very strong. 62 is, is down a lot. I mean, that's, um, about a 14% decline. Um, look, you know, GDP, the standard definition is, um, you know, it's consumption plus investment plus net exports plus, you know, government expenditure, like a four part thing. Yeah. But there's a simpler way to do it, which is how many people are working? How productive are they? Just who's working and how productive are they? That equals nominal GDP. Um, and if you have fewer people working, there's the, the economy is going to shrink unless productivity is going up, which it's not. Uh, and so this is one of the major headwinds. Now, you're right. There are some early retirees. Um, there were a lot of people who stayed home, obviously, during COVID. And just it, it's very well studied and clear that um, working is a habit, you know, it's put a good habit, I think, for the most part. But it's like any habit. Once you break it, it's hard to go back. So once you get used to not working, or working from home or, you know, we're just staying home. Um, the government was handing out checks, you know, beginning with Trump in, uh, I believe it was June 2020. Everybody got a, uh, that one was a $1,400 check. And then in December 2020, at the end of the Trump administration, everybody got a $600 check. And Biden comes in in February 2021, not to be outdone. He hands out, uh, I think, a $1,600 check. Um, so everybody got a check, like two or three of them. And uh, a lot of younger people uh, opened accounts on Robinhood and started trading Bitcoin. That didn't work out too well. But um, but a lot of people saved the money. But but there was a very there were de- very definite spikes in retail sales coming within 30 days of the checks. Well, that's not surprising. I give people free money, they'll go buy stuff. And that kind of kept the economy going. It wasn't a real boom, but it, yeah, it, 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 um, it looked good, but we're not doing that anymore. There's no more checks. Uh, and so you had a lot of people lost the habit, a lot of people staying home, watching, you know, maybe, uh, the World Series or whatever, eating Doritos, but they're not working. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people out of the habit, but they just got used to government handouts. Not everybody, but, but some. And, um, the other problem is, uh, you know, cause people say, wait a second, how can you have low labor force participation when everywhere you look, there help one of the signs, which there are. I mean, I was, right. you know, McDonald's is paying a $35,000 for an entry level, like cashier or hamburger, um, you know, maker, uh, with benefits, training and advancement. Well, that's pretty good for, you know, a uh, entry level hamburger person. Um, so there are late, the, and people call this a labor shortage. There isn't actually a labor shortage because we just talked about how you've got perhaps as many as 10 million, you know, people between the ages of 25, 54 who are sitting home. But the problem from the employer's point of view, there's a shortage of willing workers. Not, willing workers, yeah. Not workers, but willing workers. Well, what makes you willing to work? Well, a, a raise, <laughs> a good pay is, is one. You know, as employers can't afford to pay the clearing wage, to get people off the couch because they'll go bankrupt themselves. They're working on very small margins, you know, sales are declining, et cetera. So I'll pay as much as I can to get the workers, but it's not enough to get this person off the couch, so to speak. And so you've got this really weird situation. I use weird in the, in the technical sense where you have a huge pool of able-bodied, you know, potential workers but a shortage of willing workers because you can't pay a clearing wage. But that's more a reflection of uh, how stressed business is and how low margins are. And then you look at the big names. I mean, um, I guess Twitter is the most recent, but, uh, you know, Amazon, FedEx, um, you know, Target, uh, they're all looking at, at big layoffs. And they're, big layoffs, they're big, yeah. 
big layoff announcements coming every day. So um, not, but none of which is good for uh, for the U.S. economy. But, um, I, you know, the Fed looks at unemployment. I mean, I look at it because you're supposed to know what it is. I mean, uh, I would say if, you, if you're trying to forecast the Fed, you got to look at the world the way they do, even if it's messed up. Like, even if they're looking at the wrong things, which they are, as an analyst, you have to look at them to figure out what they're doing. That's that's how you do intelligence work. Think like the other guy. But then once I take my Fed hat off and say, well, what do I think? Um, the, the unemployment rate is almost irrelevant. First, that's a lagging indicator. Secondly, it ignores what we talked about with labor force participation. There is no Phillips curve. I mean, you can draw one. Last time I saw Phillips curve was flat. Well, when I went to school, curves weren't flat. But that's uh, but they're, they're just looking at the wrong indicators. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year, records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously, the theories are that are, that are they are Russia and China. I'm curious to get your thoughts on central bank record buying of gold here and how Russia and China fit into this puzzle here. Now, China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything. But Switzerland's down a thousand tons. U.S. was down a thousand tons after losing, uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey, uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one, literally one month. Their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on their balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world. Uh, but central banks sure do. And I think that tells you something. Inflation, yeah, prices go up. So we understand that. Or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money, same thing. But inflation, has, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. If there, and we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. The U.S. really started it. But U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Uh, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply because of the price of oil, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. The other source is, is demand, what's called demand pull inflation, which is more psychological. Consumers are thinking about choices and they say, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. I was going to wait six months, but hey, the price is going up. I better go buy it now before the price goes up. In the 70s, 1970s, we had both. We started with cost push from the, the Arab oil embargo. But it flipped into demand pull in the late 70s and it just spun out of control and Paul Volcker had to crush it. Today, the inflation is coming from the supply side. Some of the things we talked about, uh, um, you know, higher fuel costs. I mean, everything has to be transported. So fuel is part of everything. Uh, it gets built into the price of everything. Uh, and there are other, there are other shortages and bottlenecks and, uh, you know, costs that have to be taken up by manufacturers and distributors. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors, so they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral. And that is really hard to, to change. So what they're trying to do, they know they can't change the supply side, but they're trying to squash the demand side before it gets out of control. And this is the thing that the markets and investors are not ready for. They, inflation is going to come down fast. There's even some danger of deflation and a major U.S. recession in 2000, in, in 2023. And, and no one's ready for that. I mean, people talk about recession, but it's going to be worse than they think. And then they wrap up the printing press again, Jim. 
Yes, but it doesn't work. You know, uh, $9 trillion of QE didn't do any good. I mean, how does the Fed do QE? They buy bonds from banks, give the money to the banks, and the banks give it back to the Fed as extra reserves. What does that do for the economy? Nothing. Zero rates, you know, again, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. They don't have the tools. They're preparing for what we're talking about, which is uh, a, a world where uh, the, the, the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a it's a currency. So uh, when we see the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation right. Organization, OPEC Plus, uh, China individually, all these countries are the... the uh, uh, European, the Eurasian European e Economic Union, which is, you know, Putin's answer to the EU. All of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a, a radical change in how we pay for things. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested, you know, do you have a, uh, do you have a ton? Do you have uh, 50 kilos? Do you have five ounces? Whatever you have as an individual investor, as a bank, I think of it by weight. Because someone, someone said, gold's really going up. I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say, gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more, and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. And when, you, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is, they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, this is a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numerator. The numerator is your counting system. You know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever? And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. In 1914, when World War I started, all the major powers went off the gold standard. They said, we got to keep our gold. This is real money, and this is how we're going to win the war. And the Bank of England was faced, uh, and the Exchequer was faced with the same choice. Keynes was an advisor to the Exchequer. He said, don't go off the gold standard. Stay on the gold standard. And the reason was that if you did that, you would preserve your reputation and preserve your credit. He said, the, the war is not going to be won with money or gold. It's going to be won with credit. But if you stay on the gold standard, you'll have the credit. And that's exactly what happened. Pierpont Morgan, uh, sorry, Jack Morgan, uh, Pierpont's son, uh, organized huge loans for England and France and nothing for Germany. And England won the war. So the point is, Keynes got that right. Now, flash forward, 1925, he's talking to Churchill, and Churchill wants to go back to the gold standard. And Keynes is telling him, you got the price wrong. You know, we can't go back at, you know, four pounds, 25, or whatever the exact rate was. Um, we've got to devalue the sterling by half because we doubled the money supply to fight the war. Churchill ignored Keynes' advice, and, um, and they went into a recession, depression, before the rest of the world. Flash forward, 1944, you're at Bretton Woods. Keynes wanted a gold standard. And this isn't speculation. He wrote papers. He gave formal presentations. So 1914 is pro-gold. 1925, he's telling Churchill, you're nuts. You can't go back to a gold standard at this price. 1944, he's pro-gold again. I call that a pragmatist. Supply-side inflation can feed to the demand side. Demand-side inflation can feed on itself. But supply-side inf inflation alone does not feed on itself. It tends to destroy itself. There's an old saying, you know, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. In other words, if you make them high enough, and going back to what I just said about putting gas in your tank, think of all the things you're not spending money on. And that causes business failures, layoffs, higher unemployment, lower velocity of money. You know, you, 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 you stay home, like you said, you don't go out basically. Um, and that's what's happening now. So we're starting to see inflation come down. When it comes down a little bit from, you know, 8.2% to 7.7%, you know, people go, well, it's, it's still high. Well, it is still high. But that's a, that's a noticeable drop, and we've seen that a couple of months in a row. What's going to happen faster than markets and investors expect is that this inflation is going to come down so fast, it's going to be a strong form of disinflation. Now, disinflation is still inflation, but it's, lower inflation. And in terms of response functions, it, it, it bears a closer resemblance to deflation than it does to um, inflation, even though it's still a form of inflation. When interest rates are coming, sorry, when inflation is coming down, uh, what else is going on? Well, real interest rates are going up uh, and the economy is slowing down. 
and then it could even tip into deflation. That that would be uh, a shock to the system. I mean, in that world, cash is your best performing asset because the value of cash, the real value of cash, actually goes up in uh, deflation when everything else is crashing around you. So, um, so yeah, we're in inflation right now. It's painful, um, but it's starting to fade more quickly than people expect. And my forecast, uh, based on a lot of analysis, and it's all in the book, uh, sold out, is that uh, this disinflation, borderline deflation will prevail. And by really just in a few months, January, February, March 2023, if not sooner, we're going to be in a very severe recession. Um, and uh, people are going to be surprised at how quickly inflation comes down. And they won't be positioned for it in terms of their portfolios. I mean, for example, a uh, a uh, ten-year Treasury note would be a, a very good performing asset in this world because yield maturity on ten-year Treasury notes been recently four percent, but now it's around three and a half percent. That could come down to two and a half percent in a in a heartbeat, even lower, and that would produce huge capital gains. So it's so it's a big deal for investors and in, um, asset allocation and portfolio management, and uh, a lot of people don't see the uh, the disinflation coming. We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year. Records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously, the theories are that are, that are that they are Russia and China. I'm curious to get your thoughts on central bank record buying of gold here and how Russia and China fit into this puzzle here. Now, now, China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland's down 1,000 tons, U.S. was down 1,000 tons after losing uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons, or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one, literally one month their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on their balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world, uh, but central banks sure do. And I think that tells you something. And this is the thing that the markets and investors are not ready for. They, inflation is going to come down fast. There's even some danger of deflation and a major U.S. recession in 2000, in, in 2023. And, and no one's ready for that. I mean, people talk about recession, but it's going to be worse than they think. And then they wrap up the printing press again, Jim. Yes, but it doesn't work. You know, uh, $9 trillion of QE didn't do any good. I mean, how does the Fed do QE? They buy bonds from banks, give the money to the banks, and the banks give it back to the Fed as excess reserves. What does that do for the economy? Nothing. Zero rates, you know, again, it, it doesn't it doesn't work. They don't have the tools. They're preparing for what we're talking about, which is uh, a, a world where uh, the, the, the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a, it's a currency. So uh, when we see the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation right. Organization, OPEC Plus, uh, China individually, all these countries are the... the uh, uh, European, the Eurasian European e Economic Union, which is, you know, Putin's answer to the EU. All of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a radical change in how we pay for things. When the price goes up, I would say that what's really happening is the dollar is going down. In other words, I think of gold by weight. I, I'm interested. You know, do you have a uh, 
uh, do you have a ton, do you have uh, 50 kilos, do you have five ounces, whatever you have as an individual investor or as a bank, I think of it by weight. Because when someone said, gold's really going up, I said, well, no, the dollar's going down. You need more dollars to purchase a fixed quantity of gold, which means the dollar's worth less. And when people say, the gold's really going down, I say, no, the dollar's worth more and you need fewer dollars to purchase a quantity of gold. You know, when, when people talk about price, the first thing they do is they're really talking about dollars. You know, I mean, there's a euro price for gold, but it, the world market is based on dollars. You're privileging the dollar as the numeraire. The numeraire is your counting system. You know, is it yards, inches, feet, whatever? And if you put the dollar first and say gold is in dollars and it's going up or down, I think you have it backwards. I think you need to put gold first by weight. And then if it's worth more, the dollar's going down. If it's worth less, the dollar's going up. In 1914, when World War I started, all the major powers went off the gold standard. They said, we've got to keep our gold. This is real money, and this is how we're going to win the war. And the Bank of England was faced, uh, and the Exchequer was faced with the same choice. Keynes was an advisor to the Exchequer. He said, don't go off the gold standard. Stay on the gold standard. And the reason was that if you did that, you would preserve your reputation and preserve your credit. He said, the, the war is not going to be won with money or gold. It's going to be won with credit. But if you stay on the gold standard, you'll have the credit. And that's exactly what happened. Pierpont Morgan, or sorry, Jack Morgan, uh, Pierpont's son, uh, organized huge loans for England and France and nothing for Germany. And England won the war. So the point is, Keynes got that right. Now, flash forward, 1925, he's talking to Churchill, and Churchill wants to go back to the gold standard. And Keynes is telling him, you got the price wrong. You know, we can't go back at, you know, four pounds, 25, or whatever the exact rate was. Um, we've got to devalue the sterling by half because we doubled the money supply to fight the war. Churchill ignored Keynes' advice, and, um, and they went into a recession, depression, before the rest of the world. Flash forward 1944, you're at Bretton Woods. Keynes wanted a gold standard. And this isn't speculation. He wrote papers. He gave formal presentations. So 1914 is pro-gold. 1925, he's telling Churchill, you're nuts. You can't go back to a gold standard at this price. 1944, he's pro-gold again. I call that a pragmatist. Inflation, yeah, prices go up. So we understand that. Or maybe put differently, the value of your money goes down. You don't get as much for your money. Same thing. But inflation, has, broadly speaking, has two causes. One is called cost push. This comes from the supply side. So there's a shortage of oil. And we've got a financial and economic war going on between Russia uh, and the United States. U.S. really started it, but U.S., EU, Canada, Australia, Japan versus Russia. Um, that's obviously disrupting supply chain, cutting down energy supply, causing the price of oil to go up, et cetera. So that's coming from the supply side. The other source is, is demand, what's called demand pull inflation, which is more psychological. Consumers are thinking about choices and they say, you know, I was thinking about buying a refrigerator. I was going to wait six months, but hey, the price is going up. I better go buy it now before the price goes up. In the 70s, 1970s, we had both. We started with cost push from the, the Arab oil embargo. But it flipped into demand pull in the late 70s and it just spun out of control and Paul Volcker had to crush it. Today, the inflation is coming from the supply side. Some of the things we talked about, uh, um, you know, higher fuel costs. I mean, everything has to be transported. So fuel is part of everything. It gets built into the price of everything. Uh, and there are other, there are other shortages and bottlenecks and, uh, you know, costs that have to be taken up by manufacturers and distributors. The Fed can't drill for oil. The Fed can't plant wheat. The Fed can't make semiconductors, so they can't do anything about this. And the supply chains are breaking down. They were breaking down before the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine has made it worse. The Fed can't do anything about cost push. They can't do anything about the price of oil. But they're looking at the demand side, you know, saying, hey, if this supply thing goes on long enough, eventually the psychology will change and we'll get demand pull uh, and behavioral. And that is really hard to, to change. You cannot forecast what they're going to do. It's a guessing game to, regarding the feds because they, they're the ones that run the show, the Black Rocks and the, and the Black Stones and the, all the private equity groups that are in charge. If they put pressure on the Fed to lower interest rates, they're going to do it. It's not about we the people. It's about the ones running the show. You go back to 2020 when it all began. I'm the governor, I'm the mayor, I'm the senator, I'm the chancellor, I'm the premier, I'm the president. Lock down everything. We're going to flatten the curve. You flatten nothing.
You destroyed a load of businesses, lives and livelihoods all over the world. Oh, don't believe me. Look at the, the, the World Bank data and the, all the people have gone into poverty. Oh, oh, yeah, look at the inflation rate skyrocketing. You flatten nothing. And now they're doing it again. Oh, remember in, in 2020, by September 2020, after Labor Day, people would be going back into the offices? Oh, you forgot that one? Oh, let's go to 2021. Oh, remember people go back in the offices after Labor Day? Oh, yeah. What's the office occupancy rate over here in New York? That's about 30%. How about nationally? Oh, it's only 60% lower than it was before they started the COVID war in 2019. Oh, how about all the businesses that depend on commuters? Oh, you don't you don't need any of that. Oh, the subway travel, it's it's only 40% of what it used to be. How about all the theaters? Oh, the neon lights shining bright on Broadway? No, no. We're closing them down again. Oh, a city that depends on tourism? Oh, all the international regulations on on uh traveling overseas? Oh, America's travel, U.S. travel overseas from January 20, November 26th, the last data I looked at was December 9th, was down 77% from 2019 levels. Oh, it'll get better. It'll come back. I called it wrong in 2012. I thought the economy was going to crash in 2012. They invented a thing called quantitative easing. They didn't teach us that in Economics 101 at graduate school, nor did they teach us about zero and negative interest rate policy. They could come up with anything. The money people are in charge. Anybody that thinks they have a government of we the people they're still being taught in kindergarten to, to K-12 and, and, and graduate school. That's who's in control of the government. But now, let's go back to the facts. We had the BS from Janet Yellen. Oh, by the way, taken over by the Federal Reserve because she was the head of the Fed and now our Treasury Secretary, along with the guy playing the Fed head, Powell, going on for almost two years, they lied about it. They knew it was real. The Federal Reserve. Oh, yeah. Now looking to, uh, you know, they're, they're in the midst of trying to fight um, the strongest inflationary environment since the 80s. Um, gearing up to uh, not just taper asset purchases, but start their interest rate hike scenario. Uh, but you've warned that an artificially low interest rate policy ending would create disaster for the global financial market. Don't they know this? They do know it. That's why they were lying about inflation being a year ago. Oh, hey, I'm the Fed chair. It's only temporary. You're full of baloney, Salenti. This isn't real interest rates. And that only went on until April. Then it became transitory. Oh, and also from Yellen, the other Fed head that's the Treasury Secretary now. How corrupt could it be right in front of you? The Fed head is now U.S. Treasury Secretary throwing out the same BS month after month after month. It's only temporary. And as you said, it's at the highest since 1982, but it's actually higher because they re -re they rigged the inflation numbers. Oh, your housing prices went up 19%? No, that's not inflationary. Oh, you mean the meat, meat prices went up? Oh, they're not eating steak now, they're eating beef, so no, that didn't go up either. The real inflation rate, according to John Williams' shadow stats, is about 15%. You actually have negative interest rates when you look at inflation. And the only reason the markets have gone up is all the cheap money they've pumped into it in the United States, in, in, in Japan, in, in the EU, all of this cheap money, merger and acquisition activity, all time high. Stock buybacks, boom, hitting another boom. All the cheap money artificially threw this thing up. All the cheap money coming in from governments to artificially prop it up. Hey, here's your $600 a week, stay home. Remember that one? So the whole thing has been artificial. My belief is when Fed rate hits 1.5%, this thing goes down hard, big, and the biggest crash in world history.
I said, what a bunch of baloney this is. They're shooting at this crap that, oh, inflation's only temporary. And then it went to transitory. So they were either too stupid to know what it was, where it was going, or they knew where it was going, which I believe they did. And they're artificially keeping the cheap money flowing in because when interest rates go up and the cheap money flow stops, the economy is going to go down and the equity markets are going to crash. Look at the insider trading. They're selling out now big time. It's like $69 billion. Meantime, stock buybacks are hit at all time high because they're getting the money for nothing, buying back the stock so it looks like there's less of them available and keep artificially pushing the prices up. Look at merger and acquisition activity, all time high, cheap money. When you look at the real interest rate, what, what was the, uh, the inflation rate that just came out? What was it, 6.8%? Oh, and what is the Fed rate? Oh, near zero? So what am I, stupid? You got negative interest rates. Oh, and Germany's now sinking possibly into a recession. The richest country in Europe. And they're still keeping interest rates into negative territory. This is criminality. Because the only ones that are benefiting are the bigs. The bigs. Look again at the merger and acquisition activity. Every day, every day, buying out and the little people going out of business and the bigs are getting bigger. Here's my greatest fear and why I feel the way I do as a trend forecaster. When all else fails, they take you to war.